There have been a lot of legends surrounding the creation of Mickey Mouse. But what is true, and what is hyperbole? Well, that's easy. Hyperbole is exaggerated statements or claims not meant to be taken literally. Oh, I see, that question was not meant to be taken literally. Many people know that Ub Iwerks was involved, but to what extent? Was he jealous that Disney got all the credit for Mickey in the end? We will be exploring all this and more this week. So, let's find out! Before we start, don't forget to check out our Discord, our coffee page, and like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the things. It really helps us out. Erbe Ert Ewerks, whose name looks like my cat typed it as he walked across my keyboard, Lucifer, was born in 1901 in Kansas City as the son of a barber, putting him a cut above the rest. Waka waka! In 1914, Ub's father left, and it fell to the boy to drop out of school and take care of his family. He was 14 at the time and never spoke to his father again. Hmm, that made my barber joke a little off-putting now. Sorry about that. Ub was a pretty good artist growing up, and although his father wasn't present in his life, Ub did inherit the man's creativity and ingenuity, and put it to even better use than giving guys killer handlebars. Iwerks first met Disney in 1919 while working for the Pesman Rubin Art Studio in Kansas City. The two hit it off right away, and with their shared interest in the new technologies developing in animation, later that year they founded their own animation studio, Iwerks Disney Commercial Artists. Disney put Iwerks' name first since he felt Disney Iwerks would give the wrong impression that they sold eyeglasses. <laughs> That's pretty good. What? That's the actual reason? Wow, look at history pulling off dad jokes. Unfortunately, their business went bankrupt within a month. Maybe they should have sold more eyeglasses. The next year, in 1920, they joined the Kansas City Film Ad Company, where they worked alongside Hugh Harmon, Fred Harmon, and Fritz Freeling. Kings supporting kings, I'd say. After hours, Iwerks and Disney studied animation, still a young and crude medium at that time, and made their own cartoon shorts. Call it early TikToks, if you will. Or don't. That's fine. By 1921, Disney and Iwerks felt confident enough to quit the company and start their own animation studio. They named it the Laughagram Studio. They employed several animators they had met at the Kansas City Film Ad Company, namely Hugh Harmon, Fritz Freeling, and Carmen Maxwell. And I'll say it again, kings supporting kings. Disney was an ambitious person and had many ideas for cartoons. Inspired by Terry Toons' series Aesop's Fables, Laughagram also created animated shorts loosely based on well-known public domain stories, only in their case, not fables, but fairy tales. Hmm, sounds crazy enough to work. Unfortunately, on November 20th, 1923, their enterprise went bankrupt again. Well, never mind. Disney left Kansas City and moved to Los Angeles, where his uncle Robert and brother Roy lived. Walt convinced Ub to join him soon after. Sort of like a family affair. With financial aid from his brother Roy, Walt established a new series in 1923, which he named the Alice Comedies. The series was bought by Winkler Pictures, run by Margaret Winkler and her partner, Charles Mintz. Loosely based on Lewis Carroll's novels Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, it featured the live-action adventures of a real girl, Virginia Davis, in an animated world. This technique would later be perfected in the film Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. The combination of live-action with animation wasn't new, but it was successful enough to be developed into a series. The Alice Comedies was Disney's first modest commercial hit. It allowed him to reorganize his studio. By 1926, Disney quit working as an artist and focused exclusively on production and story development, and Iwerks became his main animator, or, speaking technically, his BFF. Ub was such a fine draftsman and fast worker that he did most of the work in the cartoons himself. By dividing the tasks, each man could do what he was best at, Iwerks created his first recurring character, Julius the Cat, who was Alice's sidekick in the Alice comedies. (laughs) 
His design was obviously plagiarized from Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer's Felix the Cat. In the cartoon Alice Solves the Puzzle, 1925, he created another cartoon cat and, incidentally, Disney's first enduring character, Peg Leg Pete. Icons all around. We love to see it. In 1927, the Alice series had overstayed their welcome, so Iwerks created and designed a new cartoon character, the once overlooked Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. The rabbit once again shared a design and personality similar to Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer's Felix the Cat. For a while, Oswald lived up to his name. He indeed brought the Disney company luck by doing well with audiences. Disney therefore wanted to improve the technical quality and asked producer Charles Mintz for a raise. However, his luck vanished when Mintz refused the raise and reminded him that he owned the rights to Oswald, not Disney. For years, numerous articles and books have claimed that Disney was surprised by this revelation. In reality, he knew very well what was in their contract. His real shock was that Mintz bought away nearly his entire studio behind his back, leaving him behind with only nine loyal employees, namely Iwerks, Les Clark, Johnny Cannon, and six inkers and painters. One of them Disney's future wife. And I'll give you a hint, it wasn't Les Clark. After losing the rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, Disney was left bankrupt once again. The legend is that Walt came up with Mickey Mouse on the train ride back from New York after losing Oswald. But that's not the story from Ub's perspective. That's right, it's time for a different POV. In an interview from 1956, Ub said that Walt came back from New York all dejected, but realizing that he needed to come up with another character fast. They began looking through magazines, searching for ideas. Ub sketched out four different characters, one of which was this little mouse. Walt loved it and thought, that's a cute character. He took it home to his wife Lillian and said, let's call him Mortimer. And she said, no, Mickey, that's a cuter name. So the truth is that Mickey Mouse was created by Ub and named by Lillian. The first two Mickey Mouse cartoons, Playing Crazy, May 15, 1928, and The Gallopin' Gaucho, August 1928, were chronologically the debut of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. The older character, Peg Leg Pete, who originated in the Alice comedy series, was reintroduced in The Gallopin' Gaucho to serve as Mickey's main antagonist. However, distributors weren't very impressed with these two cartoons, so they didn't find an immediate release. Pfft, Philistines. Around this time, the first live-action sound films broke through, with Alan Crossland's The Jazz Singer becoming a huge success. Disney had seen a Paul Terry cartoon, Dinner Time, 1927, which experimented with a pre-recorded soundtrack, and realized this novelty could be used in animation, too. And they said that talkies wouldn't last. Improving on Terry Toons' attempts, Disney created a perfectly synchronized cartoon with sound effects, music, and voices, Steamboat Willie, 1928. This cartoon was instantly picked up by distributors and thus became the first official Mickey Mouse cartoon to be released. Steamboat Willie became a massive hit, Mickey Mouse became a star, and Disney was able to establish and expand a stable and financially successful studio. This we all know, but what of iWorks? Where is iWorks Land, iWorks World, and iWorks Vacation Club? Since Walt Disney's name is more famous with general audiences, he often receives credit for all his employees' achievements. For decades, iWorks was no exception to this rule. Many articles, books, and documentaries claimed for years that Disney was the creator of Mickey Mouse. In some variations, Disney watched over iWorks' shoulder while he instructed him how to draw the mouse. Disney can indeed be credited with establishing Mickey's personality. In Spirit, the Happy Mouse owed a lot to Charlie Chaplin's Tramp character and Felix the Cat by Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer. Disney also came up with the engaging storylines which made the early Mickey Mouse cartoons such a huge success. Even if he didn't directly think up the plots, he streamlined the ideas and kept creative control. And from the Carnival Kid up until Fantasia, Disney was also Mickey's original voice. But today, it's firmly acknowledged, even by the Walt Disney Company itself, that Mickey's design was all to iWorks' sole credit. He gave Mickey his iconic button shirt, and from the Opry House on, white gloves. One would think that iWorks would get jealous or annoyed at the lack of recognition that he received through the years, but his son has some interesting insight into his father's character. People would uh, say to him, aren't you... Doesn't it upset you that Walt gets all the credit for Mickey Mouse? 
And his answer was simply not uh, not what you design or draw or build, it's what you do with it. And Walt did something with it. So he deserves the credit. And that, that was the end of that story. I mean, the fact that he drew it, and if Walt hadn't done anything with it, nobody would know about it. Regardless of Ub's incredibly humble spirit, he played a major role in the early success of the Walt Disney Company. He was an extraordinarily talented cartoonist, and his characters have a vitality which could compete with the best cartoons from the 1920s. Thanks to his amazing working speed, he almost single-handedly drew every frame of the Oswald and early Mickey cartoons. During the making of Plain Crazy, he made 700 drawings in one day, breaking the Felix the Cat animator Bill Nolan's previous record of 600 drawings in 24 hours. At his own insistence, Iwerks often worked alone an isolated genius. There's no I in team, but there is an I in iWorks. I mean, there's also a we in iWorks, but I don't know, wordplay is hard. When the first Silly Symphony, The Skeleton Dance, was made, Disney urged iWorks to let others help him animate the picture, but he stubbornly refused. Ub not only designed Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, and Peg Leg Pete, he also introduced Clarabella Cow, first seen in Steamboat Willie, and Horace Horsecollar, who was introduced in The Plowboy, 1929. Happily married with two sons, respect and admiration from his peers, and a huge salary, it seemed as if Ub's life was close to perfect, which made it all the more surprising when in January 1930, Ub went in to see Roy O. Disney and announced he was leaving the studio. Iwerks had been offered the chance to have a studio of his own and a salary of $300 a week, double what he was getting at Disney at the time. This was offered to him by Disney's former distributor, Pat Powers, who had recently had a falling out with Disney. Ah, drama, tea. Pat attempted to break up the studio like Charles Mintz did with Oswald. Most historians agree that it was personal differences with Walt, which was the major deciding factor in Ub deciding to go out on his own. Being a boyhood friend of Walt and seeing his early struggles and realizing his weaknesses as an artist, Ub was less in awe of the head of the studio than were the new animators in the public. As a result, Ub was more resentful when Walt intruded in the animation process by re-timing Ub's exposure sheets or by insisting that Ub change his method of animating to produce only key drawings and allow assistants to do the in-between drawings. Even more so, Walt had a reputation of having fun at others' expense and the shy Iwerks was an easy target for these remarks and pranks, and Walt never realized that Ub's quietness in these situations hid embarrassment and anger that eventually bubbled up in this decision. Silent scars. The hardest ones hit. Yet, while the tension between the two men was apparent, not one person can ever recall Ub saying a negative word about Walt. In fact, Ub didn't feel his leaving would put the studio in jeopardy since a process had been established to produce the Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphony cartoons and the studio had expanded with more than enough animators like Les Clark capable of doing the work. Roy Disney even sent a note to Walt explaining that there was no evidence of malice in Ub's action and that he was always a little naive regarding business dealings. Of course, Ub came back to Disney eventually and became an engineering marvel. But you'll have to stay tuned for more on that story. Until then, let's enjoy some sweet, sweet Up Iwerks animation. Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon and Coffee. And if you want to make sure this channel sticks around, you can check out our Coffee link in the description. Every bit helps. Thank you for watching this episode of Disographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another Disography.